Faith Dimensions invites you to understand more fully the subject of righteousness by faith. This is a series of 20 Christ-centered messages from the dynamic new book and study guide entitled 95 Theses by Morris Vinden. Now, with today's message on righteousness, here is Pastor Morris Vinden. Hello there. It is my privilege to talk for a little while about the great theme of righteousness by faith. This is the theme that uh, shook the world to its foundations in the days of Martin Luther and in the days of John Wesley. So in these next uh, 20 studies, it's a real privilege to talk about the core of the gospel, the essence of the plan of salvation. If we're going to talk about righteousness by faith, probably one of the simplest and first things to do would be to try and understand righteousness. There's a little text in the Bible that uh, goes to the point directly. It's short, but it certainly covers a lot of ground. In fact, uh, great preachers have talked about it for days and weeks and months. We'll just be able to scratch the surface as we look at 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. And I'm going to paraphrase it, relocating just one phrase. You can check it out for yourself. Because in the King James Version, which I'm most familiar with, this one phrase needs to be put at the beginning. It says, For he, that is God, hath made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Perhaps we could expand it this much based on the Bible and its great teachings. For he, God, hath made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us who knew no righteousness, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, uh, one of the first things about this text that has troubled some people is that it seems to indicate that God made Jesus come down here and become a righteousness for us. He made him come down and and die, that God had lost his temper because of the sin problem, and uh, he needed someone to calm him down. So he told his son, go down there and show me some blood. Give me a pound of flesh so that I can calm down over this whole problem. But this is not really what the text is trying to tell us because the Bible makes it clear that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, that God and the Son we're in this together. And so uh, we see in the great plan of salvation, Jesus in the design of the gospel becoming sin for us in our place so that we can be righteous in him. What is righteousness? Let's try and understand what righteousness is. And right here we come to an important distinction if you look at it through the eyes of the uh, behaviorist, the one who thinks of religion only in terms of behavior, then uh, you think of righteousness in terms of things we do and things we don't do. And this, of course, leads to the do and don't religion syndrome, which has driven many young people up the wall. But it, behavior is what most people think of when they think of religion, Christian faith, behavior. I've checked it out with young people who had the influence of the home and the school and the church. And in nine cases out of 10 for years, it was a behavior-centered religion. But if you look at uh, righteousness in terms of relationship, which is the faith approach to the subject, then you come up with an entirely different definition. Let's take a look at the behavior definition. Behavior says that righteousness is uh, doing what's right, or right doing. I can still hear our major professor in seminary coming into the classroom on this subject and asking the class, 
What is righteousness? And we said, it's right doing. No, he said, he drove us into the corner with it. He said, if righteousness is nothing more than right doing, then all you have to do to be righteous is to do what's right. And we already knew this was wrong. The uh, church was full of these kind of people in the days when Jesus came here the first time. They were victims of external righteousness, doing good on the outside, which is nothing more than morality. And uh, morality, according to Scripture, is not enough. It isn't even righteousness. Even though morality has benefits in this world, it is not righteousness. So the more we uh, tried to come up with a definition, the more we realized that there is only, in the end, one good definition for righteousness. It's Jesus. Romans 1, 14 to 16 tells us that the gospel is the good news of Jesus. It isn't even some great news of theological import like justification or sanctification or propitiation or reconciliation or expiation. It's simply the good news of Jesus and all that he brings with him. So um, therein, according to Romans 1, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith in the person of Jesus. So our best real life practical definition for righteousness is Jesus. He's the only one who was ever righteous in this world. The only one who ever lived a perfectly righteous life who did no sin. Now the next thing we need to face is kind of hard on our human ego. According to Romans the third chapter verse 9 and 10 we have no righteousness. There is none righteous. No not one. There is none that even seeketh after God. No, not one. It's good news that uh, salvation doesn't come to us because we seek God. It comes because God seeks us. And there's a big difference. All we can do is respond. And that's important because without our response, there's no hope for righteousness. But without Jesus and apart from God, we have no righteousness. Daniel was one of the greatest prophets who ever lived. And you can read what he has to say on the subject in Daniel, the ninth chapter. He makes it very clear that righteousness belongs to God. He said it in a great prayer there as he looked toward heaven. He said, O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us, confusion of face. If we try to look within ourselves and find anything like righteousness or holiness, we find none, only confusion. So Daniel, who was uh, probably as good a man as you'll ever find in the Bible, admitted that we have none. Well, uh, is righteousness important? I don't suppose you uh, would read your Bible very long before you understood that righteousness is extremely important in heaven's economy. Uh, nobody can see heaven. Nobody can understand the kingdom of God without righteousness. It is top priority. And if we have none, then what's to be done? What can be done? Well, the good news is that uh, Jesus comes along and offers us righteousness as a gift. And this is what this text is telling us about the greatest trade that was ever made. Have you ever traded for something? Most of us have. When I was a kid, I used to trade for uh, bubble gum cards in the back alley in New York. We used to trade marbles, and we would trade wagons or uh, bicycles, and later we traded cars. Some of you have traded houses. One time in the dormitory at college, we had a necktie swap. That was one of the most fun things we ever did. We traded some of our neckties that we never used for some we thought we could. My roommate started out with none and uh, ended up with six beauties. I guess somebody felt sorry for him and gave him an old rag and he traded up to these six lovely neckties. Somebody got ripped off that night. 
I can tell you for sure. But here we have the greatest trade you can imagine, where Jesus walks in and says to you, and says to me, I have come to trade all of my righteousness for all of your sins. Now that's the greatest trade you've ever heard of. Can you imagine trading all of his righteousness for all of my sins? Uh, I've had young people tell me, if I knew that, that he had traded all of his righteousness for all of my sins, that would be too good to be true. And if I could really believe it and knew that I stood before God as though I had never sinned, I would want someone to kill me real quick. I wouldn't want to live another minute and blow it. That's the young person's idea because that would just be too good. However, in this text, 2 Corinthians 5, I am here to offer you this great trade. It is true, it is timeless, and it is universal. It doesn't have any date on it. It doesn't say uh, good like film only up until January of 1989. It doesn't say good only for Jones or Wagoner or Smith or somebody else. This text is timeless and universal. It makes no difference who you are, where you're from, what you've done. Anyone can accept this trade. It's offered from heaven. And without this trade, there'd be no hope for any of us. It's a gift, the great gift of righteousness from heaven. And it comes with Jesus. Now, this is an important point. Some people say, uh, well, uh, if he comes and offers us righteousness, is it a gift? Uh, or is it a trade? Or is it a loan? Uh, if we turn away from God and are lost someday, even though we might have accepted it at one time, if that's possible, would it then be taken back? Uh, what is righteousness? A trade, a gift, or a loan? And this brings us to the inseparate character of righteousness from Jesus. It is impossible to separate righteousness from Jesus. It comes with him. If you want righteousness, you must have Jesus. And if you have Jesus, you have righteousness. But what does it mean to have Jesus? And that's what we will notice as we continue with this text. But for now, let's just nail it down that there is no such thing as righteousness apart from Jesus. So when God offers us his only begotten son, and it's a free gift, this offer, with him comes righteousness. And as long as I have him, I have righteousness. And if I choose not to have him, I don't have righteousness any longer. That's a great principle that's important to understand. Let me illustrate by uh, <clears> the <throat> Cadillac. I have tried to trade, really, I've tried to trade my ballpoint pen for a Cadillac. It's a good ballpoint pen. I think it cost 69 cents. I gave up on the cross pens. Uh, I've had a cross pen a couple times, you know, a nice gold one or silver one. But they don't like me. They don't even stay around. They leave after a week or two. But these little 69 cent ones, I keep them forever. So I tried to trade this ballpoint pen for a Cadillac or a Mercedes, I am not particular. And I haven't found anyone yet who would trade me. Uh, one man came up to me after a meeting where I had made this offer and he said, could I see your ballpoint pen? And I thought, sure, I had a taker right there, but he was only teasing. If someone was to trade a Cadillac or a Mercedes for my ballpoint pen, why, they'd have to be either one of two things. Either they'd have to be fools, or they would have to like me very much. And to tell you the truth, I haven't found anyone who liked me that much yet. Now, let's pretend that I have a Cadillac. You didn't trade it. I uh, bought it, and I'm single. That's the only way I could buy a Cadillac. And I'm riding around town in my Cadillac, uh, hoping I can find some nice young lady who will ride in my Cadillac with me. 
But this gets really tricky because I'm not sure whether she likes me or my Cadillac. But one day, sure enough, I become convinced that she not only likes my Cadillac, but she likes me too. And uh, we stand before the preacher and we say, I do, and we're married. When she marries me, there's something that comes with me. It's that Cadillac. And as long as she has me, she has the Cadillac. And hopefully she will continue to have me as long as we both shall live. But if she should choose not to have me, and I don't know what the divorce laws are like in your state, but uh, I'm making my own up right now. If she should choose not to have me, then she will no longer have a Cadillac or a Mercedes because it comes with me. That's the way it is with righteousness. Jesus brings it with him. And if we choose to no longer have a relationship with him, and apparently this is possible, then I no longer have any righteousness. Now, there's something else in this text that we need to notice. It says that uh, he became sin for us. He became sin for us. The question is, did this ever make him a sinner? Was Jesus ever a sinner? If you've read your Bible very much, you know that Jesus was the only sinless one. He never became a sinner. It says that he never sinned, neither was guile found in his mouth or deception found in his mouth. And when he came to the close of his life, he could look at the religious bigots, the leaders of his day, and he could say, which of you convinceth me of sin? He even said, I delight to do my father's will. And he said, I do always those things that please him. So Jesus was the only sinless one, and when he took our sins, became sin for us, this never made him a sinner. Our sins were put to his account, is the way we say it. They were imputed to him, but this never made him a sinner. If he had been a sinner in any way, he would never be able to be a savior. That's the way the plan of salvation works. So he was my savior because he was sinless and he died in my place. Now let's take a step further from the text. The fact that he took my sins never made him a sinner and the fact that I accept his righteousness never makes me righteous. I never become inherently righteous. Righteousness is not poured into me it is not something that is an entity in itself. And this again, of course, makes it very clear that righteousness and Jesus must always go together, never apart from him. Now, as we continue with the text and come to the conclusion, we get down to the method by which his righteousness becomes ours. Let's notice this short text once again. For God hath made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us who knew no righteousness, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In him. What does that mean? A friend of mine who is a Greek expert and teaches Greek went through the in him phrases in the New Testament and discovered that they mean nothing more or less than this, to be in relationship with, in communion with, in fellowship with. That's what in him means. Of course, the phrase even suggests the closest intimate relationship. And God uses that same relationship, the marriage relationship, to indicate closeness. But this is uh, talking about a very close relationship. So as long as I have the in him relationship or the closeness with him, fellowship with him, relationship with him, day by day, I have 
this great trade. I have his righteousness. And of course, this makes the relationship with Christ extremely important. I used to think that the relationship with Christ, of course, was uh, something that you uh, had if you had time, or it was reserved for the elderly people with the white hair and the arthritis. And that a uh, growing teenager really didn't have that much time for that. Uh, maybe a text for the day with your hand on the doorknob. I didn't realize that the um, in him relationship was the entire basis of the Christian life. I didn't know that that's the way we are made righteous. And then it began to come clear. The relationship with Christ is what eternal life is all about. Now, we don't mean that uh, there is something called righteousness by relationship, no. It isn't righteousness by Bible study and prayer, because you can go through the forms on that. But it is meaning that the relationship with Christ, the daily acceptance of His grace, the daily fellowship with Him, is the way we accept of His grace. That's the way we receive His righteousness both his righteousness for us and his righteousness in us through that relationship. And that brings us to the question, how do you have relationship? Well, how do we have relationship with each other? By talking and by listening and by going places and doing things together. That's the way we get to know anyone. And John 17 verse 3 says that's what life eternal is all about, that we might know Jesus and know the Father that's why we call it relational religion righteousness by faith comes from relational religion well how do we talk to him we call it prayer in the Christian life and how do we listen to him talk to us we call it his word the Bible given to us as a great love letter from heaven and how do we go places and do things together through Christian service and witness. That's the way it happens. So God has given us these three things, three methods, the same methods by which we have relationship with each other are available so that we can be in Him, according to this text, in Him. And as we have that relationship with Him day by day, we have all the righteousness that heaven has to offer. And we stand before God as though we had never sinned. And not only is his righteousness put to our account, but it becomes part of our lives as we associate with him day by day. Well, someone might say, uh, this trade seems ridiculous for God. If he's going to trade all of his righteousness for all of my sins, what's in it for him? He must be a fool. That's more ridiculous than trading your Cadillac for my ballpoint pen. What is in it for him? Is he a fool, or is he someone who loves me very much? Reminds me of the old story that came from the slavery days. Back when Abraham Lincoln stood down there at the other end of the Mississippi, he stood there by the auction block one day and he saw the auctioneer and heard them drone on with his mumbo jumbo selling slaves. There was a slave standing there named Joe, old Joe. He was old, but he was strong. He'd been many a slave for many a master, and he'd seen many hearts broken, and he'd seen separation and tears, and he'd finally had it, and he said under his breath, I won't work ever again, I won't work. And he kept saying it louder and louder, and the bidders heard. And one by one, they fell off and stopped their bidding, but finally one man bid good money for old Joe, the slave who wouldn't work. He traded, a foolish trade, if you please. He led Joe to the uh, horse and carriage. They went out of the town and into the country. They came to the uh, entrance to the plantation. They went down the road to a lake. And there by the lake was a little cabin with curtains on the window and flowers around the cobblestones and the steps. And the master said, Joe, this is where you live. And Joe couldn't believe it. He'd never seen a place like this. The sun was just setting, and it was beautiful. 
by the lake. He said, this is for me? Master said, yes. But then Joe remembered his determination. He said, I won't work, but I won't work. And the master said, you don't have to work. Because I heard what you said, and I bought you to set you free. I've always liked that story. When I was a boy, I heard the story and I liked it, but that isn't the end. Because at the end, old Joe fell at the feet of his new master and said, Massa, I'll serve you forever. Change the scene. Jesus looks down from heaven. He sees the tears flow and the hearts ache. He sees separation and sadness. He says, I'll go down and I'll do something about it. And he signed the emancipation papers for the human race with his own blood. And he bought us to set us free. And we can't work. We're tired of trying to work. We've tried our effort and our backbone. We've tried to work our way to heaven. We've tried hard to change our lives and we can't do it. And all we can say is, I can't work. And he says, you don't have to work because I bought you to set you free. And at that point, when it comes into our hearts and our lives, we fall at his feet and we say, Master, I'll serve you forever. Only now we find power we didn't have before because we are made righteous in him. No wonder it's the good news of the gospel that continues on the greatest trade ever. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for the great provision you've made that sinners can have hope of something more than a few short years here. Thank you for helping us because of Jesus stand before you as though we'd never sinned, that we are made righteous in him we pray that you'll help us to understand this better and know what it means to be in him and to have that relationship day by day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's the good news for the planet Earth, where there are four things that God does not know. God does not know a sin he does not hate. God does not know a sinner he does not love. God does not know a sin he won't forgive. And God does not know a better time than now. <laughs>